Yellowstone Lake, Great Blue Spring, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, Castle Geyser. These captivating paintings by Thomas Moran were commissioned as part of the Hayden expeditions that surveyed the western territories of the United States in the late 1800s. The scientific information gathered from these surveys, as well as paintings by Moran and photographs by fellow artist William Henry Jackson, compelled Congress to pass legislation of global significance. In 1872, Yellowstone was designated as the world's first national park. These historical events were part of a larger conservation movement that led to unprecedented public and private initiatives intended to ensure the wise use of natural resources and the preservation of wildlife and landscapes of great natural beauty. During the peak of this movement, Theodore Roosevelt established himself as the conservation president and his work to promote conservation and the preservation of over 230 million acres of land within national parks, monuments, forests, and wildlife reserves has been unmatched by any president before or after. Today, there's a new generation of conservationists inspired by Teddy Roosevelt that are creating innovative solutions to threats against our natural heritage. Much like the movement that was started over a century ago, this new approach began with trips to witness some of the world's natural wonders firsthand. But these 21st century expeditions would take the new conservationists deep into the remote tropical forests of Central Africa. Well, I first went to uh, Africa, to the Congo Basin, with Michael Fay, and, uh, Dave Barron, and some others, and really saw firsthand not only what conservation could do, but also what man could do as a destructive force. It was a rough trip, but I never have been on a trip where I've been educated more as to the value of keeping these natural resources. Inspired by what they had seen, concerned legislators and members of the international conservation community worked to create a strategy for a national park system that covered six countries across Central Africa and protected some of the most unique and endangered wildlife in the world. But the key players knew that ongoing support was necessary to keep this and other critical conservation efforts funded and motivated. My worry was that after we retired from here, the handful of members, Democrat and Republican, that were working on this, um, would no longer have any influence in the long-term outcome. But if we formed a caucus, a bipartisan caucus, and talked members into joining, then we could get critical mass for a organization that we knew would be there far into the future with an eye towards specifically keeping these agreements in the developing world. In 2003, Tom Udall and John Tanner worked with Ed Royce and Clay Shaw to form the International Conservation Caucus in the House, which brought together representatives who shared a conviction that the United States of America has the opportunity, the obligation, and the interest to advance the conservation of natural resources for this and future generations. I think this group that has come together in the International Conservation Caucus could make amazing things happen. We could go right back to the era of Teddy Roosevelt where he said, we're gonna make this happen. We're gonna start thinking about the management of natural resources in this country and we're gonna create legislation. We are going to dramatically shift the way we act, not the way we talk, but the way we act. Shortly after the formation of the ICC, Four of the top conservation NGOs formed a partnership to raise awareness about opportunities for U.S. leadership in global conservation. Inspired by these events and with the support of the NGO partnership, former members of Congress and other motivated conservationists, the International Conservation Caucus Foundation was created in 2006 to establish a new vision for the sound management of natural resources globally. 
There are plenty of environmentalists that think that endangered wildlife is more important than endangered people. We don't, but we think both are important. And there are plenty of isolationists who think that conservation dollars spent on the other side of the world is frivolous. We don't. We think it's a damn good investment in our national security, and we think it's a moral imperative. Ask Colin Powell. He was a skeptic. Then he came to realize that most of the conflicts in the world are due to increasing competition over dwindling natural resources. He got it, and then he wrote our position on it. And that is that America's future security hinges on, one, freedom, democracy, and good governance. Two, sustainable development. Three, good stewardship of natural resources. It is the International Conservation Caucus Foundation collective goal to see that good conservation policy, American conservation leadership permeates every aspect of U.S. foreign policy and U.S. foreign assistance policy. The United States government's support for international conservation, while it is not large in terms of our foreign assistance budget, it's about 1% of the foreign assistance budget, it's very important for the work that gets done of conservation in the developing countries of the world. Uh, those countries are typically poor. There are many calls upon their governments for things like uh, education, health, transportation, and so forth. So they need outside help to protect their biodiversity and manage their natural resources. And over the next 40 years or so, the world's population is going to increase by another 3 billion people. And all of the increase on a net basis will take place in the poor countries of the developing world. So they have problems now with their natural environment. And without a lot of help, and a lot of skill, a lot of good science and good conservation, those problems are going to get worse. And when they get worse, we're going to see the social and economic and political fallout from that environmental collapse violence, civil wars, boundary wars, water wars. Let's prevent some of that if we can. Call it an insurance policy, if you will, that this kind of good natural resources management can uh, function in part as an insurance policy against that kind of ecological disaster. We're working on many, many different fronts with many different sectors, with local communities, with indigenous people, with major international uh, businesses with governments and other countries. But if the U.S. is really demonstrating a commitment and a lead, that has an enormous impact elsewhere in the world. And if this whole caucus and the International uh, Conservation Caucus Foundation can further that, I think it's going to have huge impact. And I think it's really going to help us turn the tide in many places. We are happy to be able to say that we've brought together a room of a historic cross-section of support from the National Geographic Society, the Cheetah Conservation Fund, the Wild Foundation, the Audubon Society, and the Cincinnati Zoo, to Abercrombie and Kent and the Africa Safari Club, from International Paper to Anheuser Busch, the American Petroleum Institute, Exxon Mobil, BP, J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Tudor Investments, Walmart, Sharing Plow. These greatly divergent interests have one in common, and that is that America should lead globally in the good stewardship of natural resources. It's going to take coalitions to win the battles, and it's going to take reaching over to partners that we would never have thought we needed to work with or, or would work with to make it happen. If we don't bring them to the table and have them bring their resources, then we're not going to be able to get the job done that we need to get done in international conservation. You can pump out more and more and more money uh, through government expenditures and you don't see the results. And yet you can leverage smaller amounts of money out of the private sector and you can see positive, palpable results. It's a force multiplier uh, in terms of being engaged around the planet um, on these important issues and it works. And who would have thought uh, five or ten years ago that working towards conservation one would have sitting around the table 
members of Congress, leaders from some of the developing nations, representatives from Walmart and other major corporations, all working together, all trying to come up with a, a common agenda. That's a pretty new thing. I mean, that was talked about maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, but it didn't really happen. Now it's happening in a very concrete, very significant way. And I think that the ICCF has really been able to play a, a, a key role in, in uh, achieving this. This new educational foundation that you're here to support tonight is the beginning of a process, a collaboration among these divergent interests in government, in the private sector, in the conservation community, and the business community to come together and to do things in a bold and new way. One of the ICCF's initiatives has been the formation of the Conservation Council, which unites NGOs, corporations, and government leaders dedicated to natural resource sustainability. What makes this synergy unique is that every participating NGO and corporation has the opportunity to suggest specific causes or courses of action. As opposed to just kind of lecturing to all of you for an hour while you're eating, we would hope to make this a little bit more iterative and kind of hear some of your ideas, thoughts that you have about the, uh, the caucus, the foundation, how we could move forward collaboratively and collectively. We have businesses sitting with nonprofit conservation organizations talking about as individual institutions, what would we like to see happen in the world in the next few years? And what support would we like to have the U.S. government provide for that? Um, and then at the end of the lunch, we were able to step back and say, okay, with, in light of all these individual interests and efforts, what does it all mean in the big picture? And how can we tie this together into a common agenda to really push for expanded U.S. leadership on international conservation? And that's what's really most exciting to me about ICCF, is that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. We believe that it's one of the brightest spots in the whole conservation arena these days. It's bipartisan, brings together leaders from both sides of the aisle, and it advances a vision for international conservation. And the foundation, charter members, its supporters across the public and private sector provide an indispensable source of information and education to make that happen. Another key program organized by the ICCF is the Capitol Hill Educational Forum, where leading conservationists present congressional briefings that address important conservation policy initiatives and issues. There is a huge problem in northern Central African Republic. And if you'd have identified the indicators and you started paying attention to the natural resource base and human ecology in these places, you may have not only averted the loss of 130,000 elephants and millions of antelope, and the livelihoods of most of the people that live in those areas, but you may well have averted the crisis in Darfur as well. I think that ICCF appears in a world where better understanding of global processes is very much needed. Understanding that what's happening outside the borders of my country are things that have an effect on my own personal life or livelihood and vice versa. What I'm doing here has a connotation worldwide. Resources are being depleted. Water is scarcer and scarcer for people. Biodiversity as we know it is disappearing. That's a pattern that's happening everywhere. So there's a common cause that needs to be uh, fought uh, and thought about. The United States has the interest and the opportunity to protect natural resources. And protecting the world's natural resources and natural environment is essential to all of us and everything. There's a lot of pressure on the U.S. government budget right now. A lot of things that need to be afforded, if I can put it that way. And uh, there are a lot of needs for security and defense and other aspects of foreign policy. And we recognize that and we support it. We just want to make sure that conservation of natural resources and maintaining a healthy environment in these uh, poor developing countries are not forgotten. There's no lack of a challenge here, but there's one thing for sure, and that is that this earth is finite. There's only so much land, so much air, and so much water, and the more we degrade, the less we have in terms of human existence on the earth. Your responsibility, by virtue of the fact that you are sitting here tonight, 
is to do the heavy lifting. Changing thinking, changing behavior are tall orders, very tall orders. But taking a stand and engaging in respectful debate on even the most contentious issues that we have to address is what you were elected to do. This is your individual responsibility. As you debate and as you shape legislation that will help ensure our future, I implore you to be bold and to place humanity and nature ahead of politics.